Now, when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethpage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say the Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, say to the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, and they put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowds spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. All right, let's talk through this for a minute. This is a really interesting passage of scripture that we're looking at this morning. I, I, I want to rewind for a minute, point you back to the beginning of the year, just a couple months ago, at the beginning of the year. January 1st, we had a, a New Year's Day service, and because I'm the senior pastor and Duran wasn't my boss yet, I could say, hey, Duran, you're up, okay? So I'm not preaching January 1st, not because I partied hard the night before. I probably went to bed at like 12.01, so it wasn't for any of the, the, those reasons. Had him preach, and it was the week before we started the series on the book of Revelation. So I'm like, whatever you want to preach on. And he starts with one of the most interesting passages or one of the most interesting topics that would really make me think through things. And it was this topic, what do we do or what do you do when God disappoints? You remember this? What do you do when God doesn't come through for you the way that you think God should come through? I'm like, that's, that's a question that I think none of us would audibly put out there, but it's something that we think about all the time, even if we're not consciously thinking about it. We're thinking about this idea of, God, I would do this situation differently than you are handling it. You're lording this way. You're godding this way. I've, I've prayed for things to turn out this way. I have expectations on how this thing should look and how it should play out. And you haven't come through for me that way. What do you do when God disappoints, when he doesn't live up to your expectations, not his? What do we do when God doesn't live up to our expectations? Anybody been there? Like, like things don't play out the way, the relationship, the job, anything, any opportunity, anything that you have in store in your life, and it doesn't play out the way that you think it would. God, if I were you, this is how I would have this play out, and it doesn't play out like that at all. Well, here's what's interesting. As we walk into Holy Week, which starts today, the next eight days, we've got, um, we've got today with Palm Sunday, Maudie Thursday, we've got Good Friday, we've got Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, all in the next eight days. The biggest week on the church calendar. This is huge for the church, for those of us that call ourselves Christ followers. And it all begins with a triumphal entry and a story on what we now call Palm Sunday, where expectations weren't met. Where God didn't God according to man's plan. Where man had an idea and God said, but that's not my plan. And it played out differently. What do we do? So it's kind of like we're revisiting Duran's sermon. What do we do when God doesn't live up to our expectations? So let's talk about this. What's going on on Palm Sunday as we read through this and Jesus is coming in on the back of a donkey and he's entering Jerusalem for his final time, right? He's entering Jerusalem for the final time before his crucifixion. He knows what's up. It's very important that we remember this that he knows what's happening in front of him. That in, a, in, in just four days, this crowd that is currently chanting, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, and they're honoring him and they're worshiping him. He knows in four days, these same people are gonna flip the script and they're gonna be screaming, crucify him, crucify him. So he's looking at it like this. Now, here's what's going on. Here's why the Jewish people were so excited when Jesus walks in or when he comes in on the back of a donkey. Think about this. At this point in history, Jesus' Jesus's fame is at an all-time high. He's preached with authority. He's walked into the synagogues. He's opened the scrolls. He's fulfilled the Old Testament scriptures. He's healed the sick, healed the lame, healed the blind, healed the deaf, deaf even raised Lazarus, Lazarus from the dead just a couple days prior. His fame is paramount right now. It's at its peak. Everybody knows about Jesus. And the, and the Jewish people are remembering their scriptures. We don't wanna call them the Old Testament scriptures because at this point, they're just the scriptures. And they're putting two and two together and like, huh, our prophets promised a Messiah, one who would come and redeem us, one who would come and restore us, one who would come and bring the kingdom of heaven to earth. Is this the guy? They're looking at his stories, his authority, his miracles, his power, all of this stuff that he has going on. And they're like, maybe this is the guy. 
You ever get to a place where you're like, you're looking at something and your hopes and your expectations and your anticipation just goes off the charts. Like something hasn't played out yet, but you're convinced this is how it's going to play out. Like you get really excited. All of us that are like, we're impulsive a little bit. We're like, I know exactly how this is gonna play out. You've got it mapped all out. And so this is what's going on with the Jewish people. Jesus is coming into town, heading towards Jerusalem and they're going, there he is. There's our king. There's the one who's going to come in, overthrow Caesar, overthrow the Roman Empire. And here's what they're thinking. They're thinking that we're about to experience a sequel. You guys like sequels? Some of them are good, right? Like we've got Top Gun from 20 whatever years ago. That was really good. But then Top Gun, the sequel was even better. If you haven't seen the new Top Gun, you're missing out, man. The sequel, it lives up. It's better than the first. And so these people are thinking, this is the sequel. And they're thinking back to Moses and Pharaoh and the 4 million Jewish people who were led out of Egyptian slavery. And they're like, Jesus is coming, and this time instead of Pharaoh, he's taking down Caesar. He's taking down Caesar. Remember with our study in Revelation what's going on with the first century Jewish community. Think about this. There's this fine line between being oppressed by Rome and being enslaved to Rome, and they're walking that tight line. It's not the same as Pharaoh in Egypt because they still have some autonomy. They're able to run their businesses. They're able to worship their God in their synagogues. And remember why they could do this. It's because they were 5% of the entire Roman population of the Roman Empire. They had a huge contingency in the Roman Empire and Caesar didn't want them to form a coup. It's better to give them what they want to a degree, but still have them under my thumb. So no other religion, no other faith was allowed to worship their gods, only the Jewish people at this time. So they were allowed to worship, they were allowed to worship their God, they were allowed to do their things, but they also had to pay taxes to Caesar. They were ruled, they were reigned by Caesar. And the Jewish people at the time were like, we're waiting for a Messiah that's going to come in and not only liberate us, but he's gonna take the throne of Caesar. He's gonna sit up on Caesar's throne. So they had expectations. This is how it was going to play out. There's this military hero who's gonna come rally us all together. We're gonna form a coup. We're gonna rise up and we're gonna take down the emperor. And Jesus marches in on the back of a donkey with no such intent. Think about the anticipation as he comes rolling into town. And, there, and by the way, there's absolute understanding as why they would think that their king was coming. Think about this. In Matthew chapter two, Jesus is declared at birth to be a king. In Matthew chapter three, he's anointed as a king and empowered by the Holy Spirit for his kingly mission. In John chapter one, he's recognized as king in his ministry by his own disciples. In John 19, his enemies call him king. In, John, or in Luke 23, Jesus calls himself king. His parables and his miracles are about the kingdom of God coming to earth, of which he says, I am here to bring. Only a king can do that. And here's the kicker for me. This is the biggest of them all. As he's coming into Jerusalem, where is his path ultimately going to take him? He's heading towards the Jewish temple. It's at the temple that kings are enthroned. It makes sense. Here's our king. He's coming. He's going to get a crown. He's gonna sit on a throne. He's gonna, not just any throne, he's gonna sit on Caesar's throne. So this is Sunday. This is Sunday. Four days later, the script is flipped on its head. What do they do with that? When their king, the one that's supposed to be the Messiah, the one that's supposed to do things like this, and we're all like this to some degree, some of us more than others, when things are supposed to play out, we've got our own plan, we've got our own thing, we're like, yes, it's going according to plan. So much so that when something doesn't go according to plan, you kind of like, you excuse it as a glitch, right? You're like, oh, I know that's not perfect, but we're still on the path. So when Jesus comes into town and they're waving their flags, or their, their palm branches, Hosanna, Hosanna, which means praise him, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the son of David, the heir of David, the one, the promised one of David. They're singing all of these things. They're, Here he comes. Our plan is going according to plan. Here he comes. He's marching straight to the temple. He's going to be enthroned as king. Then from there, he's going to go to Caesar's palace, not the one in Vegas. And he's going to go and he's going to take over his throne. He's going to conquer the world and we're going to be liberated and we're going to rule. But he's coming in on a donkey. Not a carriage, not a white stallion, a donkey. That wasn't in my plan. So that's a glitch. And so they see him coming in, Hosanna, Hosanna, 
You know, they're, they're gonna ignore it. You know those looks you give to people where you're like, if we say it, it's real, so don't say it. Like, he's on a donkey? What's he doing on the back of it? And then they notice, what's he doing on that donkey? He's crying. What kind of king cries as he's coming in to take over? Nope, just ignore it, just ignore it. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. What's going on here? What's going on? You know what this reminds me of? And we've talked about this several times, but this year it seems more appropriate than ever. As Jesus is coming in, all hail King Jesus. Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Do you know what's going on? It's a coronation. It's a coronation. 34 days from today, ladies and gentlemen, May 6th, what's happening? King Charles is officially becoming King Charles, right? All my British people, Steve, Stephanie, I know you're here. We got Louise. We got, we got, we got some Brits in the house. Ladies and gentlemen, don't, don't ever forget 23 and Me. I spit in a cup. I sent it to 23 and Me because I thought I was French in all my life. I'm like, I don't want to be French. And so I sent it out. They come back with good news. I'm not French. I'm British. You, ladies and gentlemen, it's one of the best gifts that's ever been given to me, ever. It, it could have been anything. Just don't be French. And then I'm like, oh, that's why I love Steve and Stephanie, the, the, my Brits. I, they're my people. They're my people. Never forget my 43rd birthday. I bring this up as often as I can because it's the coolest moment of my life. My 43rd birthday, we're in London visiting Buckingham Palace and this happens. Here it is. Go ahead and pull it up. I swear it happens. It's Queen Elizabeth. Prince Philip, my birthday. She waved to me. She waved to me. My people. They're my people. Okay, you can take it down. After this, we walked away. Prince Harry drove by my people. I'm going to have a scone for dessert today or whatever that is. And I'm going to celebrate with my people on May 6th as King Charles, who has had, can we admit, man, what a bumpy ride in life this dude has had. But we're still going to celebrate him with Queen Consort Camilla. What do we do? He's got a weird past, but he's about to become king. Most of us thought, I really thought Queen Elizabeth was going to outlive me, and I was going to live to be an old man, and Queen Elizabeth's still on her throne at like 150, but now we've got King, King Charles with all the drama, with all the drama. And I, I love the Brits. I've watched Netflix. I've watched The Crown. I've watched the documentary with Meghan and Harry. I, I've watched the Oprah interview. Ladies and gentlemen, I read Harry's biography. I read Spare. If you want to be against Prince Harry, read his book. You will walk out of it going, what a brat. What a brat. And then I'm like, I know, and I'm an older brother. So I'm like, now I get Prince William more than I ever have. I, under, I totally, my people, my people, May 6th. What's gonna happen on May 6th? On May 6th, King Charles is gonna be put in this really old carriage, but it's a celebrated carriage. And, and, and he's gonna be escorted through the streets of London while millions of people line up and millions, if not billions around the world, myself included, because they're my people, are going to be watching on TV as people are hailing their new king. He's gonna go all the way to Buckingham, or not Buckingham Palace, all the way to Westminster Abbey, which in and of itself, if you've never been to Europe, when you go to Europe, visit the churches and the cathedrals. It's overwhelming. Westminster Abbey is kind of this burial spot for so many famous people. And this is where he's going to be coordinated. He's going to be enthroned. He's going to walk up. He's going to be behind this veiled curtain where it's this moment with him and God. And then the Archbishop of Canterbury is going to enthrone him and he's going to walk out officially as the king. Is that what happened to Jesus on his coronation route? No carriage. He's coming in on a donkey. People are hailing him as king. Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But it looked differently for Jesus. It looked entirely differently for Jesus. The way of Jesus' kingship, the journey to his kingship was different than any earthly king. I've said it over and over, and today I'm going to correct myself. Over and over again, for years, I have said the way of Jesus is the upside-down kingdom. And I believe in the upside down kingdom. The problem is, a couple weeks ago, I listened to a sermon by Matt Chandler, and he didn't call it the upside down kingdom. He called it the right side up kingdom. I'm like, oh, that's right. So I apologize. Even last week, I called it the upside down. It's not the upside down kingdom. The ways of this world are the upside down kingdom. It's just that we're so used to our culture and our ways of victory and power and hunger and achieve and rise and go all. And that's the way of our kingdoms, but the way of Christ's kingdom, the right side up kingdom is different. Self-denial, die to self, right? 
You want to be first, be last. You serve instead of being served. You give instead of receive. He comes to, in Matthew, we see the Sermon on the Mount, the most famous sermon of Jesus' entire ministry, and he comes up with these beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are you when people persecute you and say all kinds of vile things about you. Blessed are you. And you're like, no. The way of Caesar is blessed are those who prevail. Blessed are the victors. Blessed are the powerful. Blessed are the loud and the boisterous. Blessed are those who carry the sword. Blessed are they. And Jesus is like, no, that is for the upside down kingdom. The right side up kingdom is a kingdom of sacrifice and service. And this is the way of Jesus. Everything seems to be upside down. Jesus' coronation would end up with him gaining both a crown and a throne. But the crown was a crown of thorns and the throne was an old rugged cross. This way of thinking, I wanna read some of this just to make sure I don't mess it up. The way of thinking, this way of thinking, this right side up kingdom, and this is what I want to talk to you about. We have expectations. Upside down kingdom. We, we really do identify with Rome and Caesar. We get that. And so where did we get this and why did we twist this in our own life and our faith and in, in our, our belief in our own country? This way of thinking about the right side up kingdom is very important and applicable for us as Christ followers. We live in a world where it's still easy to fall prey to the mentality of the Roman world. Conquer, win, receive, be first. And it seeped, remember all the letters to the churches in Revelation where culture seeps into the church? It's absolutely done it when it comes to this. If we allow culture to seep into the church when it says the way of the kingdom is conquering, the way of the kingdom is victory. The way of the kingdom is our guy. If, if this, our guy not being Jesus, okay? If this is the way of the kingdom, here's what happens. If I follow Jesus, we start saying, I'm going to be healed, I'm going to be wealthy, I'm going to be without problems, I am going to be the best. But the way of Jesus' enthronement was not centered on this. It was reversed. And that's where the misunderstanding comes in. And this must, misunderstanding caused all sorts of problems. If we view our faith as a cure-all for every problem, and by the way, this is the biggest damage the evangelical church has done to the world in the last 50 years, is telling people, you come to Jesus and everything will be okay. We want so badly people to raise their hands for the sinner's prayer that we promise them something that's unbiblical. If you start following Jesus, he'll come into your life, you're gonna have eternity, absolutely true but we ignore the fact that Jesus says, when you come to me, you need to deny yourself. Pick up your cross and follow me. And following me ain't easy. But we want people to raise their hands. We want the stats. We want the filled cathedrals. We want it so badly that we manipulate and lie about the gospel. The gospel is absolute good news. But for our 100 years here on this planet, it isn't easy. And so Jesus comes with his right side up kingdom to put it all in perspective. Ladies and gentlemen, here, here's the thing. If we view our faith as a cure-all for every problem that we ever experience, and by the way, I'm not saying that Jesus won't perform miracles, he won't heal, that we're gonna have good days. This isn't a promise that every day is just gonna stink, right? It's not that at all. But it's not a promise that every day is gonna be rainbows and sunshine. If we have this idea that our salvation is a cure-all for every problem we experience, a way of avoiding suffering, which, by the way, how many of us that becomes our prayer? When you pray in the morning, how much of your time is spent, God, protect me, protect those I love, protect my stuff? Like, there's nothing wrong with that prayer. But when it's all we pray, and I think the way of Jesus is when you come to me in prayer, pray that in the suffering that your will be done. What do you wanna teach me? What do you wanna show me? What do you wanna bring me through in this? Don't let me just escape it because you didn't. Why would the way of Jesus' people be different from the way of Jesus? So if we view our faith as a cure-all, finally I'm gonna to get to this sentence. For every problem we experience in the world, a way of avoiding suffering and living what Joel Osteen, and yes, I will call him out, what Joel e. Osteen calls my best life now or your best life now, it's gonna cause all sorts of problems. If, your best, if you are living right now your best that it's ever going to be, ever, then the cross didn't accomplish much. If this is as good as it gets, show me a different faith. Because man, this cannot be 
as good as it gets. Even on my good days, right? This can't be as good as it gets. There's gonna be moments where, there's gonna be moments, what do we do when the relationship is struggling with Duran and Bethany? Duran has the guts to say that in front of everybody. I'm so proud of him with what he said. That, that's gonna happen even to followers of Jesus. What happens when our kids are a little bit disobedient, not going the way we think? What, what happens when we get the doctor's report? The prosperity gospel says, well, Jesus is going to take care of it. What if he doesn't the way that we expect him to? What happens to our faith? Imagine he does answer our prayers according to our plan and all that goes that way. Well, we still gotta live a life and there's gonna be bumps in the road at some point. The marriage is gonna have struggles. Our kids are probably going to disobey. A lump might come back. There's always going to be something in this. So is our faith on the circumstance or in the one who controls our eternity? Our misunderstanding of scripture is that Jesus is gonna make everything all right here on this earth when that's not the promise a matter of fact, and Melanie and I talk about this so much, and I don't know how I missed this for so many years of my life. The promise of scripture is really, the, the one promise we see when it comes to the condition of our life is that you will suffer if you follow me. You will. It, it's part of following Jesus. It doesn't get easier. A matter of fact, it might get harder, but that doesn't, who wants to raise their hand to that? Who wants to come forward for that? And the reason is, is because we're viewing everything through a temporal worldview. Everything is about now. The worldview that we see, our temporal happiness is, has become our ultimate goal. I want it now. I want it now. I want to trade a $1 billion check that I'll earn next week for a Snickers bar today. This is what's going on here. And if this is our goal, we're going to have our moments of satisfaction, but not all the time, there's going to be a time where the script is flipped. So the way of this world, the way of Rome doesn't make sense. I said it in my email the other day. Kings don't end up on crosses, do they? Kings send people to crosses. So what is this, what are these people thinking as Jesus comes in, Hosanna, Hosanna, donkey, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. Four days later, their hopes, their dreams are nailed to a cross. What kind of failure is this? He tricked us. He duped us. What the heck? And it's because their worldview was temporal and they didn't see what Jesus was actually there to accomplish. Their worldview was temporal and that was their ultimate goal. And here's the key. If we can see the cross as the ultimate goal, then and only then can we understand not only our purpose in this broken world, but we can also understand the purpose and suffering that is imposed upon us that it's temporary. That's why we're going through Revelation so we can see that everything going on right now is simply temporary. I wanna talk quickly and we're, we're gonna be done. I wanna talk about God's sovereignty for a minute. Um, God's sovereignty is something, I went to a reform seminary and God's sovereignty is key, okay? So if you don't know anything about the reform tradition, reform tradition is John Calvin and predestination. They're labeled one thing and it's predestination, but it's all driven by God's sovereignty. God's sovereignty means God is in control of everything, okay? So either he's in control of everything or he's not. Now, whether you believe in predestination or not, if you're a Christian, you absolutely must believe in God being sovereign, okay? He has to be in control. There can be nothing outside of his scope of control. He is in absolute control. But we don't want him to be because <laughs> we want to be in control. We want, we want to say this is the order of, of the events, this is how it's supposed to play out. And when God says, no, nah, I wear the crown, I sit on the throne that you're gonna read about in Revelation chapter four, you sit around that throne, you will put your throne at my feet, or you'll put your crown at my feet, but I sit on that throne. We're like, oh, but won't you do it my way? Won't you do it my way? And so we gotta think through this, because at stake on Palm Sunday was is God sovereign or not? Because in Luke chapter 19, there's something interesting that takes place. In Luke chapter 19, verse 41, Luke tells the triumphal entry just a little bit differently. He says, and when Jesus drew near and saw the city, what city? City of Jerusalem, the capital, the temple, his people, the Jewish people, the people he's coming to die for. And remember, he's on the back of this donkey and he knows what's up. He knows these people screaming, Hosanna, Hosanna, are about to be the same people screaming, crucify him, crucify him. He drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, would that you, even you, Jerusalem, had known on this day the things that make for peace. And they're like, we do know. 
<laughs> We've got it. You're walking in. You're doing what we know. Come in, arm us, equip us, tell us the strategy. We're behind you. We're going to take down Caesar. That's the way. And Jesus is crying with tears in his eyes. Had, if, would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace. What makes for peace? The cross. A king dying on a cross ultimately brings peace. But right now they are hidden from your eyes. It is crazy because the way we interpret this, Jesus' tears as he comes into Jerusalem, what, what do we do with that? There are three places in the New Testament that call out Jesus where he's crying. They, they, they say, this is where he cried. So it doesn't make me feel so badly that I get choked up from time to time. So does Jesus. So in Hebrews, in the book of Hebrews, it, it, it refers to a time where Jesus is praying over the people. And as he's praying, he starts weeping because the people meant so much to him. So it's pointing back to his ministry and to that time. But the other two times that we're very familiar with where Jesus weeps are within days of each other. Have you ever thought about that? Like as Jesus approaches what he knows is gonna be the end of his life, he's gonna end up on a cross, there are two moments where he cries. Why does he cry? What's the purpose of his tears? Well, the first story happened a couple days earlier in a village called Bethany. Remember this story? If you don't, let me catch you up real quick. About a couple weeks maybe earlier prior to this, Jesus gets a text. He gets a Pony Express telegraph from, or a courier shows up and he gets this message from two sisters, Mary and Martha. And the text reads, or the telegraph reads, hey, Jesus, come quickly. Your friend Lazarus is sick to the point of death. Like he's really, really sick. Mary and Martha, with incredible faith, know that Jesus has raised people from being sick. He's healed people. He's cast out demons. He teaches with authority. If Jesus shows up, Lazarus will be totally fine. Get Jesus on the road. Jesus isn't close. Send him out. Get him here. Remember what happens? Jesus gets the telegraph, reads it out loud to his boys, to his disciples. And they're like, Peter's probably like, let's go. I'm, in, I'm ready. Let's go. Like Peter wants to be the guy that's leading the charge. Let's go. He needs us. And Jesus is like, nah, let's chill. Let's play a couple rounds of golf. Let, let, let's do some stuff. Let's, let's eat. We'll wait a couple days and then we'll go. And the disciples are like, what are you talking about? He's going to die. And Jesus is like, yeah, but this is a death that doesn't lead to death. And they're like, huh? They don't understand anything, but Jesus knows what's up. He knows that Lazarus is going to die, and he knows that he's going to raise Lazarus from the dead. So a couple days later, he finally gets on the road, taking his time. Why did Jesus take his time? He wanted to make sure that Lazarus was dead. Dead, dead. Four days dead. Stinky, nasty, maggot dead. Shows up. One of the sisters meets him out on the road, and she's playing the passive-aggressive card. The other sister is still in the house, mad as heck. She doesn't even want to see Jesus' face. The one that comes out to the road says, Jesus, if you had been here, our brother wouldn't have died. Passive aggressive. I love you, but man, if you had showed up. And Jesus is like, hey, again, it's not what you expect. God's got a different plan in place. Take me to the grave. Gets to the grave. You remember the scene? He gets to the grave and people all around him that loved, and these are some of Jesus' best friends. People are crying, they're sobbing because Lazarus is dead. What does Jesus do? The shortest scripture in the entire Bible, Jesus wept. He cries. Is he crying because Lazarus is dead? That, that's nonsense. Why? Because he knows that he's about to raise him. He knows the outcome. He's not, he knows what's about to happen. Is he crying because his friends are hurting? Probably. But there's also got to be an element that he's crying because they don't get it. They don't understand. I didn't come through for them. They think that I'm supposed to go this way and God is going this way. They misunderstood he raises them from the dead. Everybody's happy. Jesus is famous. He comes into town in Jerusalem. And as he's entering Jerusalem, he knows I'm going to that temple and I'm, I'm, I'm going to be enthroned and I'm going to be crowned. But the crown is going to be thorny and the throne is going to be a cross. And they turn on him. And as he comes into the city of Jerusalem, isn't it possible that he's looking at these people waving their, their palm branches going, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And he's sobbing because they don't get it. He's brokenhearted because they don't get it. Parents, has there ever been a time in your life where you had to discipline your children with something that they will not understand for a long time and your heart is broken? I'm not enjoying this punishment. I am not enjoying it, but it's necessary. But you don't understand and your heart is broken because they won't understand it. They don't get it. They're too young. So with Lazarus, they didn't understand. When he enters Jerusalem, 
they don't understand. So when he dies on a cross on Friday, what does Jesus look like in their eyes? An epic failure. You were supposed to do this, and this is where you landed? What a failure. What a failure. What they didn't understand was three days later, which we'll celebrate next week, Three days later, he exchanged his crown of thorns for a crown of glory. He exchanged the throne of the cross for the eternal throne of heaven. God had a bigger plan in play than man did. Man wanted him to defeat Caesar and be the world's hero, and God's like, I've got a bigger plan than that. Will you submit to my plan or to yours? I wanna wrap up with a quick illustration that will hopefully make sense, and forgive me for the corniness of this, um, if you didn't grow up in church, you're not gonna get this. If you grew up in the church in the 80s and 90s, I'm about to speak your language. You're gonna love me. All I need to say is Carmen's the champion and I get people stirred up. Anybody? Anybody? If you didn't grow up in church, you're like, nah, let me fill you in. Let me fill you in on this doozy. The 80s and 90s were a special time in Christian music. Contemporary Christian music was becoming popular. You had Sandy Patty, Michael W. Smith, um, all, all of those guys, Stephen Curtis Chapman, incredible people, but Carmen was king, right? Carmen was the guy, he was the Italian stallion. And he wrote some songs that would take scriptures, especially the gospel, and he would take artistic liberty with them and he would present them in a new format. For those of us that were teenagers, Carmen, it, it, seriously, I owe a lot of my faith to the songs of Carmen. Like he made, he made the gospel make sense to me. And the champion was by far his most popular song, by far, it's an eight minute, epic adventure where it's this cosmic battle between God and Satan. And it's a boxing match, okay? So it's, it's this incredible boxing match. Now, here's what you need to know. And I've shared some of this before. When I was 18 years old, I just graduated high school. I was two years away from going to Tennessee to college. I would transfer. So I went to school in Michigan for my first two years. Not the University of Michigan, not even close to smart enough. Saginaw Valley State University. I was a cardinal, okay? That's who I was. And so I, I, with my youth group, and my youth group was everything. We did, we were one of those really small churches. Our youth group was everything. And the people in my youth group are still friends with me to this day. And we had this song, the champion. We thought we were originals. We're like, we're gonna put a human video to this. No other church is gonna do this. Every other church on the planet did the same thing. Human videos, you act out, you put drama to a particular Christian song. And the champion is by far the most overdone song of human history. Um, in that play, I was Jesus. I don't even wanna get into the details of how foolish I was. I was skinny, 120 pounds, baby oil Jesus to make me look stronger, mascara um, on my face as a beard, ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. Satan was played by a kid named Matt Eckerly. Uh, Matt Eckerly was decked out head to toe in red paint, like war paint. And, and he was one of those guys that took it way too seriously. You ever had that guy? When you did a human video and the person playing Satan's like, you're really good at that. Oh, that's scary, right? That was my boy, Matt. Um, I wrote this sermon, just as a side note, I wrote this sermon a month ago and Matt, 47 year old father of six, just found out passed away a week ago Thursday. Um, and so he, 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 great kid, love this kid. Um, MMA fighter, that's what he did as part of his living. And so this is what I was faced up against in this skit. And the skit is Jesus versus Satan in this MMA match. Right? And so it begins with a, in a vast expanse of timeless place where darkness ruled the outer space. So, and it's like God's voice, it, it's powerful. Satan enters, followed by his demons, Hitler, Napoleon, Pharaoh, Capone. And then Jesus shows up in the Son of God. And everybody's got chills. And, dun, 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 dun. and the crowd, the fight, right? you're with me. If you know this song, you're like, oh, my jams, right? And so we would fight. And, and, and it's really interesting because our youth group, man, when you're a kid, you don't know doctrine. You're just like, I love Jesus. Yes, I do. Right? It's like, you know, just, yeah, Jesus. No doctrine whatsoever. But we got this one right. We got this one right. There, there's a part of the play, part of the, the thing that says this. And it's talking about Jesus's temptation in the wilderness. It says, 40 days and night they fought and Satan couldn't touch him. So we took that to mean during those 40 days, Jesus didn't throw any blows. He, he was just dodging. He's just dodging. It's kind of what happened. Now the final blow saved for the final round. Prophetically, Christ's hands came down and Satan struck in vengeance. The blow of death fell Jesus to the ground. So this whole song is high paced, energetic, and all of a sudden, Jesus puts his hands down. What, what are you doing, King? You're, you're fighting for the championship. What are you doing putting your hands down? And as young kids, I remember when we were choreographing this, we're like, what does that line mean? 
it's as though God intentionally put his hands down. Like Satan couldn't touch Jesus without God giving the authority to do so. So he puts his hands down and Satan strikes the blow of vengeance, which is ultimately the cross. There's another line earlier where we got this one totally wrong, where Jesus, Satan says, I'm, you're dead meat, Jesus. I'm gonna take you down tonight. Jesus says, go ahead, make my day. Crowd goes wild. That's one of those moments, like, yeah, go ahead and make my day. But then when you think about it, this isn't Jesus shoving Satan, going, go ahead and make my day, come on. This is Jesus like, no, man, that's why I'm here. Go ahead, take your strike, make my day. Because I'm a king who's gonna be enthroned in a different way by a different kingdom. And in that moment where the blow of death fell Jesus to the ground, the crowd goes silent, the music goes silent. It's like, oh, takes your breath away. Remember the first time you saw the Passion of the Christ? It's like, it takes your, you're like, oh. This was the 80s version of that. We're like, wait, it's not supposed to end like that. This isn't what a king does. A king doesn't die on crosses. A king sends people to the cross. But then the song continues everything isn't going as expected. This king, Hosanna, Hosanna, is on a cross. Epic fail. God has failed. God's plans have failed. But here's the thing. If God's plans have failed, he's not sovereign. This is where the sovereignty of God comes into play. If he's sovereign, that's one, what's happening on the cross is his plan. If he's sovereign, what's happening in your suffering, it's his plan. But we don't want to preach that. What do we do with that? It's not the end of the story. The devil's roared in victory, the saints shocked and perplexed. His wounds appeared upon his hands and feet. Then Satan kicked him in his side. This is the spear going into his side and blood and water flowed and they waited for the 10 count of defeat. I should have had it played because this chills. Corny style, really corny, but not in the 80s and 90s. It was awesome. God the Father turned his head, his tears announcing Christ was dead. The 10 count would proclaim the battle's end. So to the world, epic fail. God has failed. He didn't lord the way I would have. Then Satan trembled through his sweat in unexpected horror yet as God started to count by saying, remember this part? Ten. And he says it just like that. I nailed it. Ten. Satan's like, hey, wait a minute, God. Nine. Stop. You're counting wrong. Eight. His eyes are moving. And all of a sudden the crowd's like, ooh, right? We're getting itchy. Seven, his fingers are twitching. Six, where's all this light coming from? Five, he's alive. Four, oh no, three, and yet, oh yes, one. He has won, he has won. He's alive forevermore. He is risen, he is Lord. He is the champion. Our king came for a different purpose. And it was much bigger than Caesar's throne. Do you think the God of the universe is impressed by Caesar's throne? So, Let's go back to Duran's first sermon. What do you do when God disappoints, when he doesn't come through for you the way that you expect him to? You have to ask yourself, is God sovereign or not? Either he is or he isn't. There's no lukewarmness in God. He does not straddle the fence. Either he is sovereign or he's not. If he is sovereign, then everything that happens to us has at least gone through his desk for approval. He's not caught off guard. He's not wringling his hands trying to figure out what to do with you. But I promise there's purpose in it. And as we walk through this world, we share in his suffering. That's the invitation. So that eternally we will share in his glory. Which one's better? Paul says, remember what Paul says? Paul's like, man, the weight of these temporary afflictions are nothing compared to the eternal glory that's in front of me. None of it matters. 90 years of pure torture pales in comparison to what is coming because our king went to a cross for us because it looked like he had failed. But in fact, the plan of God was the most victorious and beautiful thing this world has ever known or ever seen. So I, I, I say all of that to you this morning. Number one, look to the cross. Look to Jesus. That's the answer for everything. If your life's screwed up, if it's messed up, your hope is in the cross of Jesus Christ, period. You can't fix yourself. You can't resolve the tension in your life. You need Jesus. And I'm here to tell you, when you come to Jesus, eternity is yours. Forgiveness is yours. Freedom is yours. Victory is yours.
yours. Salvation is yours. He removes every sin as far as the east is from the west. He trades in your filthy rags of unrighteousness for his pure rags of, or his pure cloth of righteousness. All of it is yours. But it ain't gonna be easy. But it's not on you. Your salvation is secured in him, but following him is not going to be easy. But it's worth it. It's worth it. So do we trust the sovereignty of God? What kind of king do we want? One that will politically rule for 30 years or one that invites us to rule with him for eternity? I'll go with the latter if that's okay with you. And that's what God is inviting you to this morning. Will you bow your heads? I wanna give the opportunity before we even get to Easter Sunday, we'll, we'll do something similar next week. Maybe you're in here this morning and you're like, Okay, I've misunderstood the kingship of Jesus. And this morning, I want to surrender my life to this king, the one who died on a cross. He didn't send somebody to a cross for me. He died on the cross for himself. I couldn't do it. I wasn't worthy. I wasn't holy enough to die on a cross for the sins of mankind. But he was. So today, maybe you're in this room, and the Bible talks all throughout the New Testament about the way to salvation. You can't fix yourself. You can't clean yourself up by stopping doing stuff or starting doing other good things. The way to salvation is to surrender yourself to this king by faith. In your heart going, Jesus, I believe you are the son of God. I believe that you gave your life for me on that cross. I believe that you paid for my sins. And I come to you confessing today and repenting that I am a sinner, that I'm broken, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a mess. And apart from you, I have no hope. But if this message is true, if you wipe away every sin, then I come to you and I surrender it all to you. I lay every sin at my feet. I lay my heart at your feet. I ask that you'd forgive me. I pray that you would wash me white as snow. I pray that you would adopt me from this broken world into your family as a child, a son or daughter of the King, where my purpose can be eternal and not temporal get my eyes on bigger things. So I surrender to you. I receive you as both Lord and Savior. I follow you from this day forward. I know I'm not going to be perfect, but to the best of my ability, I'm going to follow you. I'm going to trust you with my life. If that's you this morning, listen to me. This is really important. If you're making that decision today to follow Jesus, before you leave this morning, would you come see one of our pastors? Would you come see Pastor Zach? He's here in the front row. Or Pastor Duran, you know who he is. Talk to them. Let them walk with you through this. Let them answer any questions you might have. All of us who are followers of Jesus today, we've all made this decision at some point in our life. Now I speak to you. How many of us look at God when things don't go according to plan? I'm guilty of this, guys. We say, God, what are you doing? Why would you do it this way? My prayer for you this morning, the prayer for me this morning, is that we would trust Jesus implicitly trust the sovereign will of our Father. Whatever it is that you're doing in and through us, God, maximize it. Let me learn the lesson quickly. Let me be your vessel for your glory and for your good. Let my life be a living testimony that people would find Jesus because of obedience. Not because everything's going well, but because in my life I'm obedient and I worship you. So God, I pray for strength for every follower of Jesus in this room. Whatever affliction, whatever time or season of torment, of struggle they're wrestling with right now, I pray that you would give them strength. Let them be bold, strong, and courageous the way you order so many men and women of the Bible to do. I pray that we would surrender our expectations and our plans, our hopes. Not that we're hopeless. Our hope isn't in our plans. Our hope is in your faithfulness and your goodness. So let's redirect our hope, our expectations. What do you want to do? What do you want to do with my life? What do you want to do with my marriage? What do you want to do with my kids? What do you want to do with my friends, my job, my neighborhood? What do you want to do? My church, my ministry, what do you want to do? And I submit to that, Jesus. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for making your kingdom solely about me, manipulating your name and your word for my advantage. I come before you as a broken pray that you would use me for your glory and your purposes. Thank you for resurrection, life, and hope.
that the cross wasn't the end of the story, but the empty tomb was. That you didn't just die, but you conquered death. You defeated it. Now you're risen so that we too can have eternal life. And that's where our hope is. So I pray over the saints. I pray over those that are coming to Christ today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.